In this video, we'll be working on some practice problems from section 3.7 on improper integrals. So for these first few problems, we're just evaluating an improper integral. And the first thing that we need to remember to do whenever we see an improper integral and we want to try to evaluate it is to rewrite that integral as a limit. So in this case, the integral from 2 to infinity of 1 over x cubed dx means the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 2 to t of 1 over x cubed dx. So we definitely don't want to just launch into taking an antiderivative and then trying to plug infinity into that antiderivative. So we can't ever plug in infinity. It's just not something that we can do because infinity is not a number. And as we're going to see, these first few examples will be relatively easy to figure out the limits. But as we go on to more complicated examples, the limits are going to be a little bit more challenging to figure out. So now that we've rewritten it as a limit, we actually sort of ignore the limit for a little while and focus on the integral. So remember that 1 over x cubed, that's x to the minus 3. So when we take the antiderivative, we get x to the minus 2 multiplied by 1 over minus 2. And then we're going to evaluate that from 2 to t. So we plug in t, we plug in 2, and then we're going to figure out the limit. So when we plug in t, we get minus 1 half times t to the minus 2, which I can rewrite as minus 1 divided by 2t squared. Minus a minus is a plus, and that's going to be 1 over 2 times 2 squared. So now we want to think about what's going to happen as t gets larger and larger and larger. So let's think about this fraction. On the top of that fraction, we have negative 1. And on the bottom of that fraction, we have 2t squared. And remember, t is going to be a gigantic number. t is going to be a billion, a trillion, a quadrillion. And so that bottom of that fraction is going to be a gigantic number. And so whenever we have a regular size number, like negative 1, divided by a gigantic number, that's going to go to 0. And then we're just going to be left with 0 plus 1 eighth, which is going to be 1 eighth. So a lot of these limits can be thought of informally like that, where we say, well, the bottom is going to go to infinity, so the whole fraction is going to go to infinity. All right, let's try this one. So again, the very first thing you should do is rewrite this as a limit. The limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to t of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx. Now that's our arctangent integral. So we get inverse tangent of x. And again, we're evaluating at t and at 0. So we get the limit as t goes to infinity of the inverse tangent of t minus the inverse tangent of 0. Now, this one's not a fraction like the one that we just did in the previous problem, but it is inverse tangent. And so here we have to know something about the inverse tangent function, which if we graph this function, looks a little bit something like this. And what we should know about the inverse tangent function is that a horizontal asymptote at pi over 2, which means that as t goes to infinity, the inverse tangent of t goes to pi over 2. The inverse tangent of 0 is 0, so we get pi over 2 minus 0, which is pi over 2. So there's no real trick here other than just knowing that the inverse tangent function has that horizontal asymptote. All right, next up, again, very first step, rewrite this as a, li a limit, limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to t of x e to the minus x dx. And again, we're just going to hold that limit off to the side while we focus on doing this integral. And this may be an integral that you might have recognized from things that we've done earlier in this chapter. This one is unfortunately going to require integration by parts. So our parts are going to be u equals x, dv equals e to the minus x dx, du will be 1 dx, and then v will be the antiderivative of e to the minus x, which is minus e to the minus x. So this is going to be the limit as t goes to infinity. So we're going to have uh, uv, so that's minus x e to the minus x, Again, we're going to evaluate that at t and at 1, minus the integral from 1 to t of v du. So that's minus e to the minus x dx. Minus a minus is a plus, so these turn into pluses. And we're going to plug in and figure out that second integral. We still have this limit. We're not doing anything with it yet. Just hang on to it. So we plug in t. We get minus t e to the minus t. Minus a minus is a plus. 1 e to the minus 1. And then the antiderivative of e to the minus x is minus e to the minus x. So we get minus e to the minus x. And again, for that one, we're going to plug in t and plug in 1. Let's go up here. So we've got the limit as t goes to infinity of minus t to the minus t, which I'm going to write minus t over e to the t. 1 times e to the minus 1, I'm going to write that as 1 over e. 
Now we plug t into our function, we get minus e to the minus t, so that's minus 1 over e to the t. And then we plug in 1, we get minus a minus is a plus, e to the minus 1, which is the same as 1 over e. Okay, so in the limit, 1 over e, that's just going to be 1 over e, 1 over e, that's going to be 1 over e, those don't have any t's in them. What about 1 over e to the t? Well, the top of that fraction is 1, the bottom of that fraction is e to the t, that bottom of that fraction is going to go to infinity, just knowing about the graph of e to the t, and so that's going to be 1 divided by a number that's going to infinity, so this whole fraction is going to go to 0. What about t e to the minus t? Well, the top of that fraction is t, which is going to infinity, and the bottom of that fraction is e to the t, which is also going to infinity. So this is an infinity over infinity type of limit. And in general, the tool that we can use to approach those kinds of limits is called L'Hopital's rule. And L'Hopital's rule says that if you want to figure out a limit of something that looks like infinity over infinity, in this case, minus t divided by e to the t, what you can do is take the derivative of the top and the bottom separately. The derivative of minus t is minus 1. The derivative of e to the t is e to the t. And if that limit exists, or is plus or minus infinity, then the original limit is the same thing. And in this case, minus 1 over e to the t, that's going to be 0, because the bottom of that fraction is going to infinity, and the top is just staying at negative 1. And so that means that this first limit that we had here is 0. So we've got 0 plus 1 over e minus 0 plus 1 over e. That's 1 over e plus 1 over e, also known as 2 over e. So that's our limit. So as I said, sometimes these limits get a little bit more complicated. In this case, we needed L'Hopital's rule. All right, one last one of these, and then we'll get into a different type of problem. Again, we see an improper integral. We want to evaluate it. So our first step is to rewrite it as a limit. So we have the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 2 to t of natural log of x divided by x squared dx. You can think about some different techniques that we might apply here, but again, this one is going to be an integration by parts. So u is going to be natural log of x, dv is going to be 1 over x squared dx, u works out to be 1 over x, and v will be minus 1 over x. So we get u times v, so that's minus 1 over x times the natural log of x, so minus natural log of x divided by x. We're going to plug in t, we're going to plug in 2 and subtract. and then minus the integral of v du. So again, that's the integral from 2 to t. v du is minus 1 over x times 1 over x, so minus a minus is a plus, and we have 1 over x squared dx. So we plug in t here in this first thing. We get natural log of t divided by t. Minus is minus is a plus, and then we get natural log of 2 divided by 2. Antiderivative of 1 over x squared is minus 1 over x, so this is going to be minus 1 over x, evaluated from 2 to t. We'll go up here. We get the limit as t goes to infinity. Again, we haven't done anything with that limit yet, but we're about to. Now you have natural log of t divided by t, natural log of 2 divided by 2. Now we're going to plug in t here. We get minus 1 over t, and then minus a minus is a plus 1 over 2. All right, so we've got four things again. Some of them don't have t's in them, right? So as t goes to infinity, natural log of 2 over 2 doesn't change, right? If it doesn't have a t in it, it's going to stay exactly the way it is. What about the things that have t's in them? Well, here we have a 1 on the top and a t on the bottom. t is going to infinity, which means that fraction is going to be going to 0. The bottom's going to infinity, the top is staying at 1, so the whole fraction is going to go to 0. What about this fraction? Natural log of t over t, well, that's going to be an infinity over infinity again, which again means again we're going to be using L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule says that your limit that looks like infinity over infinity, if you take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom, you look at what that limit does. In this case, the top is minus 1 over t. That's going to infinity. The bottom is staying at 1, so that's going to be 0 over 1, which is 0, which means this limit is, again, 0. So we've got natural log of 2 over 2 plus 1 half, and that's our value of our integral.
Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the comparison theorem. So we talk about the comparison theorem. The idea here is that we're not maybe necessarily interested in what this integral equals. We're just interested in finding out whether or not it converges. So we're going to compare it to a well-known integral called a p integral. So the p integrals have the form, the integral from a to infinity, and the a can really be anything. The starting point doesn't really matter. What matters is the long-term behavior of 1 divided by x to the p dx. And what we say here is that this diverges if p is less than or equal to 1 and converges if p is greater than 1. And so what we want to do is use this knowledge of our p integrals to help us understand this given integral. So how does this fraction, 1 over x cubed plus 1, compare to one of these p integrals? So what you want to do is think to yourself, all right, when x is a really big number, which part of this fraction isn't really going to matter? So this plus 1 here is going to be insignificant compared to x cubed when x is any reasonable size. So if x is 100, x cubed is going to be way, way bigger than that 1. So if I get rid of the plus 1, then these two fractions are pretty close to each other. And so what I want to understand is the comparison between these two fractions. And what I can say is that because this fraction on the left has a larger denominator, because the number on the bottom is bigger, that makes it a smaller fraction. So we've got a smaller function here. And what we know is that the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x cubed without the plus 1, we know that that integral converges. We know that that integral equals some finite number. And so our integral is smaller than something that converges. So our integral, the one that we were given, can't go off to infinity. It can't have infinite amount of area there because it's smaller than something that has a finite area. So the comparison theorem, that means that the given integral has to also converge. We don't exactly know what it converges to, but we know it has to converge to something because it's smaller than something that converges. So that's how the comparison theorem works. So the justification is the inequality and the knowledge of the sort of baseline, in this case, p integral. That's how we make our conclusion. We have to have those two pieces of information. All right, so let's try that with this one. So we have the integral from 5 to infinity of 1 over the square root of x minus 4. So to figure out what to compare it to, you want to think to yourself, what's really not going to matter in the long run? When x is a billion, what's really not going to make any difference? And it's going to be the minus 4. The minus 4 is not really going to have any bearing on the value of this function when x is a billion. It's not going to make that big of a difference. So this 1 over square root of x without the minus 4, that's what I want to compare it to. But which one's bigger? Well, the fraction on the left now has a smaller denominator. Yeah, the minus 4 doesn't matter, but I'm still subtracting 4, which means that fraction on the left has a slightly smaller number on the bottom, which means it's a bigger fraction. Smaller denominator means a bigger fraction. And what do we know about this integral from 5 to infinity of 1 over the square root of x? Well, that's a p integral with p equaling 1 half. Square root is x to the 1 half. And since 1 half is less than or equal to 1, this known integral, this p integral, diverges. So our integral is bigger than an integral that goes off to infinity, an integral where you have an infinite amount of area under the curve. So our integral is bigger than that, which means it also has to have infinite area. And so the comparison tells us that the integral that we were given, 1 over the square root of x minus 4, has to also diverge because it's bigger than something that diverges. So again, here's our justification. We've got the inequality and then the knowledge of the known integral. All right, a couple more of these. Same idea here. This time we've got a little bit more complicated comparison. So we've got 1 divided by x cubed plus 3x. So again, what's not really going to matter as x gets really big? Well, both of the terms on the bottom of my fraction matter, right? x squared and 3x are both going to be really big when x is really big. But x squared is going to be much, much larger. When x is a billion, x squared is going to be much, much larger than 3 times x. So the comparison, I'm just going to keep the most important term, the most important thing in terms of doing my comparison, which is the x squared. Now the fraction on the left has a larger denominator, 
which means that it's a smaller fraction. And we know that the integral from 1 to infinity of x squared is a p integral with p equaling 2, and 2 is greater than 1. So that means this p integral converges. So our integral is smaller than something that converges, which means it has to converge. So the integral that we were given has to also converge. And again, the justification is your inequality and your p integral knowledge. That's how we get this conclusion. We need both of those pieces. All right, finally, this one's a little bit tricky. So we've got the integral from 2 to infinity of natural log of x divided by x. Now, if we try to look at this in terms of comparing this to uh, just keeping the part that matters, we would say, well, both of these pieces, natural log of x and x, they both go off to infinity, but x is going to be much, much larger. When x is a billion, x is obviously a billion, but the natural log of x is much, much smaller than that. So we might compare this to 1 over x. And if we look at these two fractions, we would say, well, natural log of x is bigger than 1, because natural log of x is a, a bigger function, right? As long as x is more than e, which it will be eventually. So the fraction on the left has a larger numerator. And so that means that it's a larger fraction. And what do we know about the integral from 2 to infinity of 1 over x dx? Well, this is a p integral with p equaling 1. 1 is less than or equal to 1, so this one diverges. So again, we have a fraction, an integral, that's bigger than an integral that diverges. And so our integral has to also diverge. So that means that the integral that we were given from 2 to infinity of natural log of x divided by x has to also diverge because it's bigger than an integral that diverges. All right, so in this video, we've talked about how to actually evaluate improper integrals, and then we've also talked about how to use the comparison theorem to determine whether an integral converges or diverges. And these will be important tools that we'll use uh, coming up soon when we talk about sequences and series.